There are many ways to get the things that we want for ourselves in our lives. But basically, it all begins with how we choose to think. As you think, so shall you be. I don't know why you do what you do. What is your motive for action? What is it that drives you in your life today, not 10 years ago, or are you running the same pattern? Or your web? The needs, the beliefs, the emotions that are controlling you for two reasons. So there's more of you to give. Yeah, achieve too. We all want to do it, but I mean give. Because that's what's going to fill you up. And secondly, so you can appreciate, not just understand, that's intellectual, that's mind, but appreciate what's driving other people. It's the only way our world's going to change. Everyone's going to hit adversity. Everyone's going to hit adversity. It's how you deal with that adversity. And a key word is you, not letting somebody else deal with that adversity. You have to deal with that adversity. And how you deal with it, are you going to fight through it or are you going to curl up and just roll over into the corner? It's going to pretty much determine how the rest of your development from a mental standpoint is going to carry you. You cannot win the war against the world if you can't win the war against your own mind. But it first starts with a sound, right? There's this sound that I hear, and that sound moves me, all right? That sound moves me. So this was a sound that I heard years ago. And there are times in my life where I just stop and I play this sound because it does something for me internally. It moves me. Write that down. The very first thing that needs to happen to you every single day is you need to be moved. You need to be moved. Whatever it is that you can do literally to incite it. Listen to me very closely. When I say find something that moves you, what most of you do wrong is you're waiting for something to move you. Instead of creating the thing every day, that moves you. And the reason why I say find something that moves you because what separates humans is our effort. There's some of us, we give 70% to what we do. Some of us, 80%. Some of us, 90%. Some of us, 100%. Some of us, 120%. And so when you move, and you are moved, it allows you to operate at a whole different level. We kind of have this idea that while well, you're free as a child, and then you, if you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child, and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic, way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. And so the book is in part a matter of encouragement. It's like, lay yourself, lay a disciplinary structure on yourself get the chaos in, in check, and then you can move towards a state that's freer, because it's discipline first. Like, look, if you're gonna become a concert pianist, there's gonna be several thousand hours of extraordinarily disciplined practice. That's the imposition of order on your potential, let's say, but what comes out of that is a much grander freedom. And so in virtually every freedom that you have in life that's true freedom is purchased at the price of discipline. At some point, you gotta start winning. You can't always look for other people to help you. Other people got their own problems. They got their own shit they yeah. got to deal with. They're trying to achieve their own goals. They're will they are willing to assist, but after a while, if you constantly looking for assistance, constantly looking for help, it's on you. Your failure and your success is on you. You wouldn't be having that opposition if you didn't have something great in you. If your dream wasn't alive and on track, right on schedule to come to pass, you wouldn't have so many things coming against you. But when the enemy looks at you, he says, oh no, here comes another dreamer. Here comes another person full of faith, believing that they have seeds of greatness, not moved by their circumstances, not upset because they have a delay, they're a dreamer. They know they have the favor of God. They know because they believe all things are possible. They know God can make a way when they don't see a way. Friends, when you're a dreamer, you're dangerous to the enemy. You give him a nervous breakdown. He knows you're headed to a new level. He knows you're coming into overflow. 
He knows you're going to set a new standard for your family. And here's the most important thing. He knows there's nothing he can do to stop you. The forces that are for you are greater than the forces that are against you. But he will work overtime trying to convince us to settle, to give up, to stay where we are. You have to remember this principle. When negative things happen, that's not stopping your destiny. That's a sign that you're on your way to your destiny. Every delay, the setbacks, the disappointment, that didn't stop your dream. It's all a part of the process. Say, birds of a feather flock together. You run around with losers, you will end up a loser. Unconsciously, unconsciously, you will pick up their ways, you'll pick up their habits, you'll pick up, most importantly, their attitude about life. If you're around cynical, negative people all the time, you will become cynical and negative. You got to watch yourself. Many of us are living out the lives of other people, living out their conclusions, living out of their consciousness. The other thing is that you begin to look at, looking at your life and looking at what it is that you want to achieve. Another crucial thing that you must do is align yourself with powerful people. Align yourself with people that can encourage you, people that can empower you, people that you can learn from, people that you can grow from. That's very important. See, if you have people around you that can contribute to your growth. When I wanted to become a speaker, I joined the National Speakers Association. I wanted to be around the Dr. Norman Vincent Fields, the Zig Ziglar's, the Dwayne Dyer's. I wanted to be around people that were doing what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn from them. And you want to do that too. You want to align yourself with people who think like you, people who dream like you, people who want more out of life, people that are stretching and searching and seeking some higher ground in life as opposed to the majority of people somebody said always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded and see you don't want to be on the bottom see it's easy to be on the bottom it doesn't take any effort to be a loser it doesn't take any motivation any drive in order to stay down there on a low level but it calls on everything in you ladies and gentlemen you have to harness your will to say I'm going to challenge myself. Sometimes I have to pull myself out of bed and say, come on, Les. Things I know I should do, I don't do. Things I shouldn't do, I do. I found that the biggest enemy you have to deal with is yourself. There's an old African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. I need to practice. Remember, before the day comes, you got to practice. You cannot be standing at the free throw line playing professional basketball in the seventh game of the NBA championship and to hope right then you're going to be practiced. Practice is too late. Larry Bird used to, the great basketball player, he used to shoot, whatever, a thousand free throws. Eight in the morning. My friend Adon Ravine trains a lot of the pro basketball players. LeBron James, he trains, uh, he trains uh, Durant, Kobe, Chris Paul, and he says, these guys are up when everybody else is sleeping, they're practicing. So everything you want is going to entail a good bit of practice. So many people come up to me and say, Gary, it's so hard. I look, I look at their Instagram and they're not posting any of their content with hashtags, which is a by accident way to pick up exposure in a world where they have no money. When you have no money, when I took over my dad's business, it did $3 million a year, 10% gross profit, $300,000 before expenses. My first year marketing budget was $14,000. When you have no money, and I built that business from a three to a $60 million business in five years. I had to make every penny perfect. So I was right about email marketing in 96, and I was right, and because of that I had 91% open rates. When Google AdWords came out, the day it came out, I paid five cents a click for words before anybody bid me up, and I was super right, and that worked. If, How much is that luck versus preparation, and do you ever get anything wrong? What, what do you do when get, you make a mistake? I, I get everything wrong. It's just that I can't recall it because once it's wrong, I'm moving on to the next thing. Like dwell, dwelling on what you f***ed up on is the quickest way for the next thing not to work. Right? Yeah. So like, so I think I do everything. I mean, you know this. This is a fun thing to say. Some people in the back know this. I was a breakout YouTube star in the first year, 2006. I decided that the right strategy was to leave YouTube completely and go to Vidler because Vidler offered me equity in their company and I've left an enormous amount of attention. 
I deviated from my intention thesis to do short-term economics and equity in a company, and I lost. I lost. When DRock finally came in my life two years ago and we started to try to build up my YouTube for the first time, I was sitting on 40,000 user followers in a world where I could have had millions if I just stayed the course. So I make mistakes all the time. I'm reorging VaynerMedia every day because it's based on a mistake I made the prior year. I just don't give a f- about my mistakes. Everybody else cares about your mistakes. If you're worried about your own mistakes, you've already lost. You know, I'm always looking for new ways to explain the power of the five second rule and the power of five second decisions. And I read something that Tim Ferriss said that really resonated with me. And he had this one line buried in a podcast somewhere that just jumped out and it's it's stuck. And what he said is he said something about how there's a gap between the world and the things that trigger you and your response. And your entire life is that gap. When you start to this is not what he said, he kind of identified this gap and I, of course, intrinsically was like, well, absolutely, that's the five second window between instinct or stimulus and your reaction. And when you start to understand that your whole life plays out in this five second gap and that there's a gap that's five seconds long between fear and courage and there's a gap that's five seconds long between self-doubt and confidence That is your life. And what's super cool about understanding that your whole life is inside this gap is it's so small, everybody, that you have the ability to control it. Life's always gonna throw triggers at you. And there will always be all kinds of cool things that inspire you, your wisdom. And you get to choose what happens in that gap. Do you succumb to an excuse or do you push yourself forward? So you went to Harvard and you dropped out. Have you ever thought how your life could be better off if you had gotten your Harvard degree? Well, I, I'm a weird dropout because I take college courses all the time. I love uh, learning company courses and, and things, so I loved being a student. And there were smart people around and you know they fed you and they gave you these nice grades that made you feel smart. Uh, so I, I feel it was unfortunate uh, that I didn't get to stay there. But I don't think I missed any knowledge because you know whatever I needed to learn, I, would, I was still in a, a learning mode. I came up with a slogan, and I tell it to my kids all the time. I say, there's no losing, only learning. There's no failure, only opportunities. And there's no problems, only solutions. So to me, what failure is, failure is the mother of all success. If it wasn't for Michael Jordan getting cut from his ninth grade basketball team, he wouldn't have became Michael Jordan. (laughs) You know, if it wasn't for, uh, I seen an an article the other day where they were talking about Oprah Winfrey and how she got fired because she wasn't good for television. You know, you got people like Walt Disney who got fired, if I'm not mistaken, from a newspaper saying he had no imagination. (laughs) (laughs) Tu me entiendes lo que te estoy diciendo? (laughs) These are the same people that I got to deal with Tell me what's not, what's not a hit record. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you tell them? You tell them, you know? You know that, that all they can do is learn and come back bigger, better, stronger. Because all it's going to do is lead you in the right direction. See, if you're always winning, then you don't really understand what it is to win. You, you got to take those losses. You got to take those hits. There's got to be the valleys, the peaks, the ups, the downs. In order for you to, when it does happen, you go, wow, que rico. You know, this is what it's all about. And not only that, it's never about making it, guys. It's always about maintaining it. That's the toughest part. Patience is for the impatient. That in fact, when you're getting started and your in-laws are making faces at you and you're not sure if you're gonna be able to pay the rent and you don't know why you're living in Brooklyn to begin with and you're gonna to have to move back to Florida, it's easy <laughs> to say, you know what? I need to go faster to pick up these scraps and pick up these scraps. And sometimes what that does is it gives you the foot up to get to the next level, but sometimes what that does is it just makes you a scrap collector. And that one of the things that we see when we look at the work of people who have put really big ideas into the world, who have built online platforms, right, is that they got there by being patiently impatient or impatiently patient, whichever way you want to juxtapose it. That if you look around at the blogs you read or the the people you respect online or the organizations you want to work with, the myth of the overnight success is just that, a myth. That, you know, the much vaunted Twitter was a failure, a complete failure for two years. Nobody used it. 
And if they took the mindset of, well, if it doesn't work in two weeks, we've got to go do something else, you never would have heard of it.